Good morning, everyone, and a very cold welcome from Denton, Texas this morning. I'm so happy to have our um, first professional development career planning and development session with some wonderful colleagues, um, just the best, and I'm so thankful to be here with them today. And as you can see, Dr. Dawson is joining us from the University of Houston, and I'm just thrilled that she could be here. We've had so many challenges with power outages, water, no water. And she said she still wanted to be here in spite of all those things. So thank you so much, Dr. Dawson, for joining us today to still be on this panel. Thank you, I'm happy to. Oh, we have the best colleagues ever. And I wanna send a special shout out to the West Federation Cree for just an amazing, amazing conference so far. And for thinking of this topic to help our PhD students and for our junior faculty who want to advance and grow in their career. And so let me just uh, share a little bit first about our panelists. I was so excited when everybody said yes and agreed to be on this panel this morning. And I have um, actually had the pleasure of working with everybody here. Um, you know, that's one of the beautiful things about our industry, right? And the theme for this conference, Hospitality Stronger Together. And I can reach out to anyone on this call and say, can you help me with something? And I think that's the beautiful thing about our industry. But I'm gonna start at the top. I see Dr. Giselle is at my top left. Good morning, Dr. Giselle. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning. And can you just share with us your position and title really fast? I am a professor at Purdue University and I'm also the uh, department head for the hospitality uh, program. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And then to my right, I see Dr. Douglas at the top. Good morning, Dr. Douglas. Good morning, Dr. Williams, and good morning, everyone listening. Um, thank you for the invite, and I'm happy to share my experience that will help uh, the future students, um, well, not future students, but future faculty members um, on their journey. Um, I am at Auburn University, and I am an associate professor. Fantastic, thank you. And Dr. Dawson, thank you so much for being here, welcome. Sure, thank you. And, and I apologize to everyone that I am having the camera issues um, that I'm, you can't physically see me. Um, I am at the University of Houston, as Dr. Williams mentioned. Um, I am the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. And as part of that position, um, oversee all of the faculty and, our, and many of our staff academic positions. But the main thing I hope I can bring today is, is just focusing on the kind of the hiring process because I usually oversee all of that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I also have the pleasure of working with PhD students in a required course that we have. It's a hospitality education course where we train them on teaching. And so I, I hope I can incorporate that today and I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. Um, and just for everyone who's joining us this morning, please feel free to put your questions that you have, and we will have 10 minutes, as mentioned at the beginning, we'll have 10 minutes to go back and address any questions that you have. All right, so I wanted to get started. I threw this out this morning based on our experience that we're having, all the weather changes, just everything that's going on. Um, and I pulled a couple of job postings because I'm about to post a position. And one thing that struck me in a lot of those posters is that they're seeking rising scholars who are collegial, collegial. And so I wanted to get your advice on the importance of collegiality, collegiality for our PhD students. How important do you think that is and how can they address that when they're applying for positions? That's kind of a tough one, isn't it? I think I'd like to say one way that they can address that, though, and it kind of goes with something I was, I'm going to elaborate more on later, is they really need to be a fit with that organization. And so when they're when you're applying somewhere, you're looking, um, would I enjoy working there? And, you know, you're interviewing them as much as, as we're interviewing you. And, and look at who your colleagues would be. And do you think you know, can you add, would you enjoy working with all of those people? When, this happened by accident and I wanna share this with you, but in, uh, in one of our faculty searches years ago, 
as assistant professors, we ended up going to lunch with the candidate. That happened at the last minute. We usually, it's the search committee. And after we had lunch with this candidate, that we the first thing that we said was, well, we can see them working directly with us because they would have been about a year or two behind where we were in the process. And that just stuck with us. They're, how, how we did their collegial and they fit right in with us that we look forward to collaborating with them or working with them in the future. Excellent point. I would uh, definitely support what Dr. Dawson has shared from that experience. Uh, it's an intangible asset that you would have and it really comes across in personal interactions with those um, that you visit when you're visiting um, for campus interviews. That's something that uh, could come across and that's a question that you're uh, your search committee would have in the back of their minds. They're looking exactly at how you interact or engage with, how you how you kind of fit in, how well you know um, the culture. Or there's it's it's it really is about a lot of intangibles. And if it's not the right fit for the right um, for the right university, it it might not work. And collegiality will follow you throughout your entire career, and it is going to be a factor. At that uh, sixth year, uh, at, at the sixth year, when you're up for tenure, that is a big, you know, component of um, what's also being assessed as well. How well does this has this candidate been um, working together with the unit over the years? But along the way, even before you get to that point, hopefully, whichever institution you're in or you're at, they will have addressed that, whether it's at your third year review or it would have been an annual, depending on the university you're working with. So I would definitely support what Dr. Dawson has said. And it's sometimes hard to measure collegiality ahead of time. Uh, you, you can get a sense for how, uh, how well the individual interacts with folks, but I think collegiality comes into play in, in, as a faculty member in, in willingness to give up personal time to uh, for group time, and and you know it's, I've seen so many assistant professors who who really just uh, lock themselves up and work on the research. When we we push them a lot in that direction, but I, I think the collegiality piece comes in where okay I, I can give up a little bit of this time to meet with everybody to meet. Uh, for the good of the unit, so to speak. Um, and collegiality comes into play in many different ways. It's not just with your uh, faculty, the faculty that you're part of, but also administrators and alumni. And, and uh, can, can you uh, work with those groups in a constructive way? I think all of those points are fantastic because we have to remember just circling back that the interview is two ways, right? So to remember mm -hmm. for the candidates that it has to be a good fit for them. And this is your extended family. These are people that you're with sometimes more than your family members. So just to make sure like you're saying, if you're gonna be spending this time that you also feel that this is a good fit for you. So those are fantastic points. So now I have another question for you. And this one is very tough for me, but let's see what you think. But what is the most important thing in your opinion that a PhD student can do to successfully plan their career in academia? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I was just about to <laughs> volunteer you, Dr. Giselle. <laughs> well, I, I, the most important, so you're assuming here that they've already locked and loaded the job and now they're moving forward. Um, what, yes, right, yes, yes. And, and well, you know, we we uh, we provide feedback every year on progress towards promotion and tenure, which which is usually the goal here at at uh, Purdue, and I'm sure it's the goal at, at all of your universities get, to get that promotion and tenure. Um, I, I think the most important thing they can do is is uh, demonstrate excellence in in discovery and, and in the classroom and, uh, and be engaging in, in uh, 
all the, the, the different aspects of the department. You know, we have a faculty member right now who is who is involved in every aspect of, of the mission. You know, in the end, to me, it's an easy case uh, down the road when you get somebody that, that that's involved um, in all parts of our, our mission. Now, Dr. Giselle, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna back up for a minute. So if I'm a PhD student oh, and yeah. I would like to, I'm so sorry, okay. um, pursue a career in academia, what should I be doing now as a PhD uh, student to make myself an ideal candidate? Okay, I'm sorry, maybe I misinterpreted. No, 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 I wasn't clear, I'm sorry, forgive me. So right now, I think it's a, uh, it's a little challenging right now. I think the, the market is probably a little bit tight, my guess. Um, and uh, when I look at the applications, we do have some positions open and we're, we're um, actively uh, interviewing folks right now. What I see, and I get a lot of applications, but what I see is, is a, uh, a lot of similarity. So we're looking for that standout. And what stands out in, in my mind, what, well, um, expertise in something other than tourism marketing, which is, it seems like every other application wants to teach tourism and marketing. And so if I get an application that, that's from somebody that doesn't want to teach that, <laughs> that stands out to me. You know, uh, I, I'm, I guess I'm looking for expertise as it relates to how we've described the position rather than just a general uh, flood of, of applications. So, so if we're looking for somebody that's gonna be teaching finance, um, we're looking for that particular expertise. And, and, and I would say that's one of the areas right now, uh, finance and statistics that, that, you know, we're always looking for folks in those areas. Is that, uh, did I get more closer to the- You did. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Hi, HG. <clears throat> Welcome, Dr. Fossa. Good morning. Good morning. Somehow I thought time a little bit off. But I, my good friend Richard is there. He'll call for me. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fossa, we, we were just discussing um, one of the most important things that PhD students can do to stand out as a candidate as they seek uh, tenure track positions. Well, two things. Um, I have guided almost 34 students with master PhDs. Mm -hmm. One advice I give to them is very first thing, what is your passion? They need to know. Because after PhD, most people think they only one track. That means I want to get my associate, I'm going to be a full professor, I'm going to be a professor for life. That is great. But not all programs are the same. There are some two years program, four years program, teaching programs, truly driven research programs. So every doctoral student have to do a soul search. What track do you wanna go? You wanna be in that research driven institution where I can excel, there is a master doctoral program, I wanna do that. You know what? I would rather go to teaching school where there's a balance between the two. That's important decision. When I advise my students, know them. You know what? You should go to this university. This fits best for you. What you want to be. I don't want everybody to think they have to be at Harvard only. No, no, no. There are thousands of other schools. Okay. What is your passion? You want to be a teacher? The amazing schools are out there. Not really. So every doctoral student has to do the soul search. What is my passion? You want excel research, research only? There are some great schools for you. You want to have a balance between the two? There are good schools for you. you just want to, I'm done research. I just want teaching. Go back. So doctoral students have to do the soul search, what they want to be, a 
according to it, find the search. That's my advice to them. Fantastic. Find a fit. Fit between who you are, what you want to be. That's so important for me. That's why I advise my students, you know what? That's your passion. You should be here. This is your passion. You should be here. They should be fit between who they are, what they want to be. Wonderful. I, Thank you. Please. Can I elaborate a little bit on what uh, Dr. Parsa just yes. contributed? Because it, it helped me to reflect on my own experience going through the process. And one of the things that I did was to begin with the end in mind. So um, where is it that you'd ideally like to see yourself? Know those institutions, know, you know, keep, keep, keep um, a track of what the institutions are all about, what their faculty are involved with, and try to align yourself um, from as early as possible in your PhD career with what that end goal is going to be or that end institution is going to be for you. So your fit is easier to, um, to demonstrate when you put together your packet for submission for an application, it is going to stand out. Like Dr. Gazelli mentioned, you know, looking for something uh, in along these, um, these applications that just stand out. So beginning with the end in mind, and do not be afraid to identify mentors as early as you can, whether within your program, or, or outside of your program, as you are networking at different conferences. And once again, you want to be shaking hands with those deans and directors of the institutions that you've identified that where you'd like to position yourself, let them know your names early on. And wherever they are, any conference that you're able to attend, and if they're in attendance, seek them out, have casual conversations with them, join sessions that they might be moderating or, you know, just network and use that to the best of your advantage, but identify what that end goal is as early as you can in your career, in your, in your time, in your PhD, and then insert along the way strategic moments of contact where you can build on those relationships that help to align you for that fit. Well said. Well said. Can I add one more line to it, Kimberly? Sure. Her second piece is the lifestyle. Are they married? Are they single? What a commitment. Which part of the country they want to live in? Those things also play a role in where they want to be in. You, person, you have a lifestyle. I have a student who's married. 42 years, more than 42, with two kids. You know what? In your lifestyle, your wife is working, I'll advise you for this place. If you're only 27, single, ready to go up to the sky, at the moon, we'll send you that away. Careers are not just the research and job, it's about lifestyle with the fit. Do you fit New Orleans or do you fit Las Vegas? That's also important. Some people don't fit some parts of the country. Okay, so that's important. Not, we are not flexible machines. Take it to Massachusetts, put them in, you know, Texas. Yeah. That's important. Thank, uh, you. Mary, thank you so much. Mary, I'm gonna throw this next question to you, but I just wanted to chime in on something. Um, a speaker that we had mentioned that a mentor walks alongside you and an advocate walks ahead of you. So I just wanna throw that out there for our PhD and junior faculty to remember that because almost everybody on this call has been a mentor or an advocate for someone I know or for me personally. So start growing that network as Dr. Douglas has said because that's extremely important for your future. All right, next, so should PhD students or junior faculty, should they prioritize research publications, teaching experience, and are both to be strong candidates? I really, Dr. Dawson, oh, good, go ahead. I really think um, it's a balance of both. And, and, and I wanna, on the last question, something that I just wanna add, add to that, and it goes along with this one is, is you, one of the hardest things I find that new faculty members 
um, challenge they have is finding a balance between teaching, research, service, and that right balance. And because you hear, you know, you, 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 re, you know, basically publish or perish mindset, right? I'm not going to make tenure if I don't. But, but it, teaching is, in our college, we prioritize teaching just as much as we do research. You have to be an excellent teacher. And if you're, you can be a great researcher, but if you're not doing it well in teaching, I think people have a misconception that you can still make tenure. And that's not true. You still have to be do be doing excellent in the classroom as well. So that's a struggle to find that balance. And usually people after their first year, year and a half, they start to find that. But in terms of prioritizing, and it goes along with the first question as well, you really have to find that research focus because you need to stick. And I know there's a lot of opportunities for PhD students and junior faculty members. People will say, are you interested in working on this project? And it veers off of your main focus. And it and me personally, when I work with someone, I want to then work on what they are because I don't like them that they're waiting on me. And I put my stuff to the side sometimes. And it's really important not to get in that habit because you want to focus in your area and keep growing and advancing research in that area. And if you can get in that habit as a PhD student, that's helpful as well. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Giselle, I want to ask you this. What is one thing you wish you knew that could have helped you get a job in academia? One thing you wish you knew prior to getting the job? Um, for example, I wish I knew the importance of research and I started asking faculty to join their research projects earlier than I did. Um, to, to, I knew what I was very interested in and had a passion for it, but they didn't have many other people that shared the same passion as I did. Um, so I didn't really have a mentor to guide me in that particular area, but I wish I'd have taken advantage of those opportunities sooner. What do I wish? That's a great, great question. <laughs> <laughs> So what 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 do I wish? That's a great. That's a hard question to answer. It's almost looking back and asking, uh, would I've done something different? Perhaps. Yes. So, uh, I, I maybe would have. Uh, maybe would have taken more classes in uh, certain areas that you know that I think would have helped me as I as I got going. Okay, I, I discovered that you know I didn't know a lot, <laughs> and I had wished I had wished that I you know had um, been able to spend more time. Uh, I, I, actually, I think this is true for any PhD student. It's it's easy to take classes, and uh, I think PhD students would take at least my experience is they they would take classes till they're. You know, Till we actually force them out. Uh, it's easy to take <laughs> classes. It's fun to take classes. They have a beginning, they have an end. It's that dissertation that always causes the issue. Uh, and, and I wish that I had taken, I wish I had maybe taken a little bit more time that, than, than what I did and, and uh, developed more expertise in, in certain areas. That, that would help me that would help me yeah. specifically would help me in the research world i agree Kimberly, if yes I, if i may um, the hospital discipline has evolved so much when we were getting a phd all we have to do know our methodology do my dissertation Oh, by the way, you got a PhD. You can teach human resources. You can teach marketing. You can restaurant. You can hold, oh, you can do all those things. I got my PhD in marketing. When I went to teaching, spring quarter, my dean told me, "Oh, Parsa, you are teaching human resources and hotel, hotel operation. What do I know? That used to be not anymore. Not anymore." more and more doctoral program in hospitality tourism that requiring experience in teaching, certifications, learning. So that's so, so important. Let me go back to what Alicia said earlier, network of mentoring. That makes 
all the difference in the world, in the world. Your mentors are your coaches. They help you, they guide you, they will lead you. One advice I have for our uh, young faculty and doctor students, this is what I did to become a better teacher. I used to go to well-known, well-recognized, well-respected professors. I used to sit in their classes, take notes. Wow, this is what makes him a better teacher. One professor was ranked by rank your professor top 10 in the country, in the United States. Amazing teacher. Then I went to class with Roger Blackwell. He's a Hall of Famer in teaching marketing. I sat in classes. In other words, just like we take research methodology classes, get good in methodology, for us to get be better research methods, we take research methods classes, statistics, everything else. Similarly, to get better in teaching, we have to follow the good teachers who are there. Just like we follow good research in research, good teaching. That outstanding teacher may not be the, the most respected researcher. No, he's a good teacher. Good teacher. Uh, uh, Richard, you know that there are a lot of amazing teachers we call teaching faculty. They also come from industry. So I highly advise our doctoral students go to those classes, take notes how they do. I'll give one example, two examples, how I got there. Um, somebody might know there's a professor at the UCF. He starts everyday class. Before he starts, he puts it on paper, a cartoon, simple cartoon. Why? This conversation that cartoon has something to do to this topic. And I learned that. Now, all my classes start with thought for the day. A statement from Lincoln, uh, Einstein. Point I'm telling my students is teaching is class is more than just subject. It's a people that you connect with. That is important. I learned those things, many, many, many things like that by attending, sitting in the classes, some outstanding teachers taking notes how they do. Lastly, one more point is a good teacher, a good teacher is a good storyteller. There is a beginning, there's a peak, there's an end, there's a review at the end, review at the end. Oh, by the way, outstanding teachers don't end the class the day, they don't. Next day, when you come back, what did we do last class? They reviewed one more time. Point is, semester long, there's connectivity between all the chapters I'm teaching you. They are not bits and pieces, you're done. Okay. So these are the things I learned by watching some outstanding teachers in the field. I advise that, go visit them, learn from them. Fantastic. Um, before I see a question that's there, before I get to that question, um, Dr. Dawson mentioned that she does a lot of hiring for the University of Houston. And I wanted to circle back to you for a moment and see if there's any tips, advice you can share about uh, the application process and interviewing process with our PhD students and, and, um, and junior faculty. Sure. You know, I think before your interview, really research that institution. I think Dr. Parsa had an excellent point, you know, to go back and see if you feel like you're a fit there. Um, and think about the location and the university itself. Everybody's gonna ask you a question in your interview of why do you want to join us? Why do you wanna come work at this particular institution? And do your research, find out about that. And when you answer that question, really think about, you wanna be truthful of why you express you're a fit and why you think that. Um, and, you know, and what is it specifically you want, why do you wanna come there? People usually make that, they'll, they'll either 
uh, not research and they'll say something like, well, I have family that live in Houston. And you're like, well, that's great. But why do you want to work at the University of Houston? You know, it, it, you really need to answer that specific about what's unique about that institution. Um, the second thing is, is you want to really research the promotion and tenure requirements ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that you have what it takes to make tenure at that institution? Are you, if, if it's going to be, you know, if you're really a strong teacher and you find out that you're, you are going to have a very light teaching load, but you're going to have to do a lot more in research. Is that something you want to do? Or are you hoping that you can teach more classes and there's less requirement? Find that out and find out where you feel that you'll be happy and find that balance. Excellent. Does anybody want to chime in and answer that? Sure. Mary made an excellent point. Very good point, Mary. Point is, suppose a doctor student looking for a job, a, a university, I, this is what I recommend to them. Go to the university website, look at the faculty. What are they doing? What are they publishing? Where are they publishing? Especially, don't look at assistants yet, associates and full person. What's the track record? Look up. Then, like Mary said, do I fit that profile? Do I want to be there? Do I want to be there? So that's how you fit. Wow, that's what they're doing now. That's amazing. I can be like them. I'll give one analogy, Kimberly, if you, if you don't mind. Sure. Sports analogy, we just had Super Bowl. You know what happened? Tom Brady could have gone anywhere in the world. He could have played in China, people watching. But he chose Tampa Bay. Why? It's a fit. That's what they do. He did not go to somewhere else. Raiders are Detroit, definitely not Detroit. They're not winning anytime soon. It's a fit. It's the people out there, me like them. I have a student who moved to Connecticut, never been to east of Mississippi, never been east of Mississippi in his life. He job in Connecticut. He always calls me, Dr. Persa, how do I get back to West? As an example. So knowing the faculty who are there, what they're doing, do I want, am I, do I fit them, their profile? If not, don't even apply, you will not make it. Like Mary said, there's some schools are out there, they may not respect your research, get a piece of it. They want, want a better teacher, not a research, vice versa, have this balance between the two. That is so, so, so important. You fit in the culture of the institution. Fantastic. Fantastic. Can I, can I just elaborate on um, something Thanks, that both, both um, Dr. Parser and Dr. Dawson mentioned? And it's when you're creating your application uh, packet, I cannot stress enough about not making it too generic. It is going to show with that search committee whether or not this is, you could, you know, just remove the university's name and the position and just put another university's name and position. And it's going to be very easy to identify those kinds of applications that you didn't take the time to research the institution and to equate what your fit is and with the with the position announcement and what you have to bring to the table. And, and truly articulate that in a storytelling fashion as well. I mean, be creative. When, we, when Dr. Gazelli talks about applications that stand out, it, it will be those, those applications that are not very generic, that are not very generic at all. It's gonna be applications that show that there is, the effort was taken to, to know some of the faculty members, to know the institution, the program, what the program stands for, where the program is going, and where you ideally see your contribution um, being in that program. So now you've demonstrated, this is where you have a gap. This is what you'd like to identify. Here are my skill sets, And this is exactly how I can help the program get, and I want to get from this level to the next. 
And that was something that uh, I, I can easily say was um, for me when I applied here at Auburn University and I came for the interview, there was just something about the place, about the people that felt natural. And it was, um, it was a decision that was um, easy to make because I could see myself really helping to develop a program. It was not a, um, you know, our program has come a very, very long way since I've been here. I've been at Auburn, um, I think 12 years. Sometimes I forget how much time yeah. has flied. But um, the, the, point, the point is, what, what do you see yourself doing? Well, how do you visualize yourself in that position five years, 10 years from now? It's a, this is a career. This is a lifelong career. And I, um, I've mentored several uh, PhD students through the process and they're all uh, to their own respective institutions teaching and doing research and doing just well. And one of the, the things I, uh, I share with them is just, you know, this as a student, remember that what you're going through right now, it's not likely to change a lot. If you find yourself in difficulties or not liking or not having the passion for what the process is like for you right now, you might likely have the same problems after graduation and finding yourself in an, an institution. Even though you're a grad student, you might not be getting the check that looks like an assistant professor's check. Much of what you're doing at this level, at your level where you are right now, that's it for the rest of life with added responsibility, more classes, more teaching um, responsibilities, more research responsibilities, more service responsibilities. It just blossoms a little bit more. And then yes, you get that paycheck, but that's what your life is going to be. If you're not enjoying what, what you're doing right now, you're likely not to enjoy it after graduation. Excellent point. Um, we have three questions, so I would like to try to answer the three questions that I see in our Q&A, if that's okay. Um, one is from John, the first question. He says, hi, Richard and Alicia, great to see you here, and thank you so much for hosting the session. His question is, how would you convince the industry professionals of the world to consider academia and go for a PhD? And there's a smiley face at the end of that. I just want to let you know. Uh, Alicia, you're going to go first? It's John Locke. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I was going to say, if this John Law, I didn't see the name. That, you know, Adam before Eve? <laughs> um, okay, can I think on that just a little? Dr. 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 Gazelli, you, you can take this one first, right? Um, I, you know, uh, he's asking us, how would you convince an industry professional to consider yeah. jumping into the world of academics? I'm not, I'm not sure that we, uh, I think if the industry professional is successful and content and, and enjoys doing what they're doing, so be it. I, I think at some point, um, everybody in their careers examines what they're doing and, and why they're doing it and, and mm -hmm. You know, if if that's the point at, that we that we catch them, so to speak, I think we we uh, our discipline is is very very much of a uh, experiential discipline, and, and we we really depend upon professionals uh, in our in our uh, curriculum and and in our careers. So to me, it's an easy one. You know, if somebody comes in with with a lot of experience, they have a lot to share, uh, and, and I think everybody will benefit from that. Uh, and I think that's how I would would convince them. I, I uh, but if they're happy doing what they're doing, you know, we, we we can still engage them in in certain ways. We can we can have you know them as guest speakers. We can hire them as continuing term lecturers. As, you know, there's a whole host of methods that we can use to incorporate them into what we do. Whether they want to go on and get a PhD, that's a big commitment, and, you know, especially if they've developed their career and, and uh, you just can't shift gears that easy uh, at times. So I'm not discouraging, but I'm just cautioning. So, John, you can apply to Auburn, Purdue, um, <laughs> Dr. Parser, you said Ohio State, uh, do a <laughs> University of Houston. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, please all those talk to me as an external mentor. I'm glad to help you. <laughs> and Kimberly, Richard, it's a very good point. Very good point. Industry people, if they're happy with what they're doing, for them to switch, she's tell me, it's very stressful, very difficult. Did it. I was a regional manager. I got 35 restaurants. Go back to PhD. I lost all my study skills over 10 years period. Mm -hmm. Lifestyle is biggest challenge. Biggest challenge, lifestyle. You are used to certain lifestyle. You are GM of the hotel property. You walk in, you do things. You come to PhD, they tell you you're this small. So difficult the transition. Mm -hmm. Financially it's difficult. You have to make a living with a little budget. That's difficult unless your spouse supports you. Thirdly, PhD is a mission. It's not making money, it's about a mission. You got to come from within. Internally, you had to feel that I want a PhD. It's just not like another diploma you get in the mail, it's not. It's a commitment. So industry people are afraid to make that financial distress they have to take, family commitment, lifestyle change, it's difficult. But come back to it. I came from industry. Richard came from industry. And I'm sure you all too. But you don't have to. But excellent point is we have industry professional coming back teaching our classes as adjunct faculty. Do for one year. Do for two years. If they're happy, if they like it, then make it a full time. If not, trial and error. If this is not for me, I'm going back. John, that's my view. And talk to us. We'll help you. We guide you. We don't charge you anything. We'll be here to help you. Fantastic. I'm going to jump into this next question. This is a good question. Um, it is hard sometimes to tell your staff or faculty that you did something wrong, or you have to correct their behaviors or the way that they perform. Any tips for that? Any good ways to address them? I believe that good leaders need to take the risk of being a bad person who tells you what is wrong. That's what Richard does every day for a living, right? Department heads, that's what they do. Kimberly, you do that all the time. I'm somebody does it too. We do all the time. Yeah, that, that is hard. My advice, that if someone has to do that, read the book, uh, Crucial Conversations. You've never read it. Um, that really gets you because for me personally, that's not my personality <laughs> um, to do that. Um, but I've found a better way of, of, of reaching people by you're doing more for them by being direct and telling and helping them grow than you are from not bringing those things up. I agree. I agree definitely. And, I, and Richard, and Mary, I think we know that that's often challenging, but I always see it as having um, constructive criticism. And I think delivery helps the way that you deliver that information because all of our faculty, we have their well being and best interest. We don't hire somebody if we say you're tenure, tenure track. We do not want to let you go in six years. We have invested a, in a considerable amount of time, energy. We want you to be successful. So if we share that with you, then the goal is to help you to get tenure and to be successful in your tenure track position. So I just want to share that. But please, again, I think that's the important part of having a mentor or someone to guide you because they're going to tell you, they're going to have those difficult conversations with you. There's someone that you can lean on to get advice so that even if I'm the chair, everybody doesn't feel comfortable coming to me as the chair to seek advice from me but they can go to other faculty that they can also, that they have a rapport with to get assistance as well. And I think that that's extremely important. Okay, let me have, we have, oh, go ahead, Dr. Parsa. I had one more line to it. Whenever you do those things, constructive criticism, my advice I learned a long time ago, those conversations, those conversations should not take place, should not take place, your office or their office. They should not. Please be neutral place, cafeteria, private room. Don't do it in your office. You have the power. 
don't do their office, their home, going home, telling them their home is dirty, doesn't work. Do it in a neutral place, conference room, cafeteria, private, but still neutral place. That's highly recommended in communication literature. It's very nice. Very nice, I agree. Okay, here's a question, Dr. Giselli. What particular subject did you do you wish you had taken while you were in a PhD program? And to all panelists, I have more than 15 years of finance experience. Do you wait industry experience? So my am, am I answering that question? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I think the course the courses that I might have taken that that I didn't. Uh, and and I, I think it's become more valuable in, in the last 10 years, and it's qualitative research. And I, I'm not sure that at the time that I was a student, there, there might have been a, a few courses, but they certainly weren't uh, necessarily on my agenda. I was more on the quantitative side. So I, I, and I wish I had more study in that area. Um, and I think that's that's probably as specific as I can get in that. As to the second question, he, I, I think the individual asked about how much do we value experience. Well, I can say this much: we're seeing we're seeing less experience in the applications for our PhD program than we would like. We we you know we we want the individual to have experience. I think that helps them tremendously in the classroom. Um, so we value experience tremendously. Can I jump in on what Dr. Giselli said um, for the first question about the qualitative research? Uh, so what we have done here at Auburn is to establish two uh, methods tracks. A student can come in and decide that I want to do quantitative research or I want to do qualitative research. And there's a series of courses in either of the two that you progress through. But regardless, you must take at least one course in the other track. Uh, and I encourage all students who work with me because if you are going to see yourself at a research institution down the line, as you are going through your uh, your time in the program as a PhD student, ensure you have, if it's not a stats class, a qualitative research class, a methods class, survey, design, something to do with research, have at least one, uh, at least, I'm sorry, one course that is in the research, um, in research methods each semester. Because if research is going to be a part of your life forever, be developing, be working on those skill sets. Research is practice. It is, it is an, it's an action verb. So it's not something you do in a vacuum and then, you know, just jump, take some time off Dr. and Douglas, come back. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Very well yes. said and an excellent way to close our session. On behalf of West Federation Cree, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to our wonderful panel of experts, Dr. Giselli, Dr. Douglas, Dr. Parson, Dr. Dawson. Thank you so much. Be safe and well, everybody.